David Hyman, if the music industry has a veteran, you don't seem to have many grey hairs, um, it's you. What have you been up to the last 15 years? The last 15 years? When I say music industry, yeah. I mean digital music industry. Sure. You are one of the pioneers, the founders of this whole industry, if it is indeed an industry as opposed to a disaster. Um, you know, I've got a singular passion which is trying to change and improve the way people consume music. So um, that's what I've been up to the last 15 years. Um, yeah. And what were the companies that you founded? You counted before you're currently CEO and founder of Mug, but before that? Well, um, you know, I was a co-founder of Addicted to Noise back in 1995. Which was the original original. It was. It was the first editorial site for music online. Um, that was very early. Yeah, and we merged it with SonicNet, and um, SonicNet um, became the largest kind of content-based music destination in the 90s. MTV acquired us. Um, I had one painful year there, running marketing. <laughs> for MTV.com, VH1.com, SonicNet. And, uh, and I was brought in um, to a company called CVDB in uh, end of 99, early 2000, to turn it into a business. It was called CVDB, and I turned it into GraceNote. Um, and GraceNote's responsible for, you know, providing core technology to all the MP3 players. Um, and, um, and I've been doing MOG since 2006, which is um, the one I'm most proud of. I was around also in the mid-90s. I had a startup, you may remember, called Audio Cafe. Um, and it seemed back then that we were continually debating business models. We were continually debating the idea that we didn't really know how we were going to make music in, in music online. But we figured that eventually a business model would arrive, like if you wait long enough on the street, a bus will show up. Has that bus come yet? <clears throat> it's a really good question. I think, I think there's going to be more than one model. Um, consumers have lots of different requirements and different consumers want different things. Um, and so I don't think there's going to be one answer for everybody. Um, music is the second biggest leisure activity in the world, I'd imagine after television and so it's a huge market and it can it can withstand and maintain lots of lots of different types of companies in the in, in the ecosystem from you know things like top spin serving artists that want to reach out directly and, and merchandise companies um, uh, community sites ad supported content sites like pitchfork um, I think there is a place for uh, downloads, there's a place for subscriptions, which is the business that we're in. Um, there's a place for music videos like Vivo, clearly. Um, so I, I think it's, um, you know, it's clearly in flux and it's in massive transition. Um, and so you get a lot of carnage on the side of the digital music highway. But you also get a lot of new companies. What did you least expect in 95? What, what did we most get wrong, do you think? Was it piracy? In 95? Yeah, I mean, when you think back... No, um, this, that, was, that was really pre-privacy uh, uh, privacy and, and piracy, sorry. Um, you know, that didn't come along until uh, 99 when Napster came out. Right. And, you know, CDDB, you know, was obviously a, a, a key component and allowed people to rip CDs. And that didn't really flourish until, you know, Winamp and some of the early MP3 ripping software, which helped make peer-to-peer -peer work. <laughs> you know, the metadata had to come from somewhere. Um, <clears throat> you know, 95 was like an age of innocence. It was a beautiful time. I mean, when, when I was addicted to noise, it sounds so antiquated now, but it was the per first place for daily music news. Before that, you were limited to Rolling Stone or, or you know, MTV music news. And so, because the economies of scale could obviously never support a daily music newspaper. 
I think somebody once tried a, a, a printed sports daily newspaper that couldn't even pull it off. And so the first place where you can read reviews and listen to a sample while you read the review, that was, to me at the time, incredible. And it all seems so prehistoric now, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you know, Ray Kurzweil talks about um, you know, the exponential rate of technology, you know, and so now things to me like iTunes and syncing with a cable seems antiquated, right? When the iPod came out in 2002, it was revolutionary for most people. There were some MP3 players before it, but they were cumbersome and they lacked a good UI and a good store. But, you know, the value of the cloud and having all your music instantly available everywhere is just so superior to okay, I've got to put some on my Nano, it's got limited storage, I've got a cable, I've got a sync, carrying different devices where you don't always have what you want wherever you're going, to me now seems painful. And it's only, you know, seven years old, six years old. Um, so it's just amazing how spoiled we get so quickly.